Shalom everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking about what does it mean to be born again. And um, I'm just going to ask you who would, uh, to bless our time together. Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to share your word and to share it with the people um, who you've called me to, to minister to. Um, I ask you to open our eyes that we can see, our ears that we can hear, and our hearts that we can understand, Father. And um, I just thank you for all those who can receive what you've given me to share today. And I thank you in Yahushua's name. Amen. Okay. Um, this says, You are my hiding place and my shield. I have waited for your word. Turn away from me, you evildoers, for I observe the commands of my Elohim. What does it mean to be born again? This is from John 3, and this is the Institute for Scripture Researches, um, 1998. It's called the ISR, and you can get this um, restored name scriptures from BibleHub.com. Just select ISR, and you'll be reading an, uh, in a restored name scriptures. And there was a man of the Pharisees, Nachdemon was his name, a ruler of the Yahudim, the Jews. This one came to Yehoshua by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from Elohim, for no one is able to do these signs you do if Elohim is not with him. Yehoshua answered and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born from above, he is unable to see the reign of Elohim. Nachdemon said to him, How is a man able to be born when he is old? Is he able to enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? Yehushua answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he is unable to enter the rain, into the reign of Elohim. That which has been born of the flesh is flesh, and that which has been born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you have been born from above. The Spirit breathes where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who has been born of the Spirit. Nachdemon answered and said to him, How is it possible for this to take place? Yehushua answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Yahshuael and do not know this? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak what we know and witness what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If you do not believe when I spoke to you about earthly matters, how are you going to believe when I spoke to you about the heavenly matters? And no one has gone up into the heaven except he who came down from the heaven, the son of Adam. And as Moshe lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the son of man, the son of Adam has to be lifted up so that whoever is believing in him should not perish but possess everlasting life. For Elohim so loved the world that he gave his only brought forth son, so that everyone who believes in him should not perish but possess everlasting life. For Elohim did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe is judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only brought forth son of Elohim. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their works were wicked. For everyone who is practicing evil matters hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But the one, does, the one doing the truth comes to the light, so that his works are clearly seen, that they have been wrought in Elohim. So that's the conversation that Yahushua had with Nick. Nakdimon, or Nicodemus as we know his name, about being born again. From Matthew 19, beginning at verse 16, And see, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good shall I do to have everlasting life? And he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one, Elohim. But if you wish to enter into life, guard the commands. He said to him, Which? And Yahushua said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, respect your father and mother, your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have watched over from my youth, what do I still lack? Yehushua said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. 
And when the young man heard the word, he went away sad, because he had many possessions. And Yahushua said to his taught ones, Truly I say to you, that it is hard for a rich man to enter into the reign of the heavens. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the reign of Elohim. And when his taught ones heard it, they were very astonished, saying, Who then is able to be saved? And looking intently, Yahushua said to them, With men it is this is impossible, but with Elohim all is possible. Then Kepha, or Peter, answering, said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. What then shall we have? And Yahushua said to them, Truly I say to you, when the son of Adam sits on the throne of his esteem, you who have followed me in the rebirth shall also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Yasharel. And every one who has left his houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. But many who are first shall be last, and the last first. What does it mean to be born again? A study from a believer helped me to understand this best, but when I pondered on it, it expanded greatly. What does it mean to be born again? The explanations I was given never really sit well with me. After my church experience of about 35 total years, I left the church feeling as though I was being called out by the one I knew as God, and I began learning on my own by the one I knew as the Holy Spirit. I had made the personal choice for God at 10 years of age, had walked right up the aisle between many people on my left side and on my right side, and had told the one I knew as God that I wanted to live for him, and I dedicated all of my seven children to him in church, obviously after they'd been born. And my five sons were circumcised, the circumcision that is widely performed today, the Brit Pariah, not the Brit Milah that Yahuwah commanded. Far less is cut off on the Brit Milah. Another topic you can research on your own, but here's a star just to start proving a point that the way we do things today is not the way things were scripturally done, according to Yahuwah Zabaot, our Elohim. In Genesis 17:11, the scriptures reveal Elohim's institution of circumcision for Hebrew males. Little detail is given here, though it is clearly critical for the descendants of Abraham and involves some sort of excision from the male reproductive organ. The great majority of modern readers and many scholars as well assume that the practice referred to in Genesis 17:11 and in the rest of scripture must be the same one which is performed today. However, evidence from history, scholarship, and even the scriptures itself shows otherwise. Obviously, some sort of excision was involved, as with the modern procedure. But the modern procedure, if it were performed with a knife, as indeed it is in many Jewish circumcisions today, could only be performed as a multi-step, multi-cut procedure. The 1906 Jewish Encyclopedia describes the original procedure, Brit Milah, as a one-cut procedure, removing only the actual foreskin, the skin which, is actually, which actually extends beyond the glands. This makes sense when, for instance, we consider the hurried circumcision with a sharp rock performed by Zipporah in Exodus 4, 24-27. This simple one-cut milah procedure did not remove the high amount of complex and varied tissue removed in modern times, Additional evidence that the procedure was less extreme is apparent in the circumcision reversals mentioned in 1 Corinthians 7, 18a, referring to removing the marks of circumcision by stretching. And then it says, see the BDAG lexicon. And the apocryphal book of 1 Maccabees, chapter 1, verses 14 to 15a, many passages in the Talmud also refer to drawing the skin back down. A modern circumcision would be tediously difficult to undo by stretching the skin back down. But why is modern circumcision so much more extreme? According to the Oxford Dictionary of the Jewish, Re Jewish religion, Brit Pariah was added to Brit Milah 
after the time of the Messiah in order to prevent the very reversal alluded to by Paul. The following paragraph from Jewish World, written by an author who has conducted much research on the subject, summarizes the issue as follows. The scriptural command for circumcision had its scope extended by the rabbis to address the unacceptable practice of epispasm, or it looks like some of the letters are cut off here. Um, looks like it's uh, decircumcision, motivated by the wish to assimilate into Greco-Roman society or possibly convert to Christianity. While the scriptural requirements is to remove the foreskin only, the rabbis introduce complete uncovering pariah of the corona. It is important to note that the authors quoted here are not from some anti-circumcision faction within Judaism. They desire the tradition to continue, but are showing that pariah is a man-made tradition, not the original divine directive, but an extension of it. Another reason why it's important for us to start learning some Hebrew, because Yahuwah um, ordered or commanded the Brit Milah, not the Brit Pariah. Jewish sources include much evidence for this unauthorized modification. In Jewish writings, circumcision and pariah are treated separately. In addition, the Samaritans and, Sam and Samaritan historical sources emphasize that the circumcision tradition, which continues from the pre-pariah separation of the northern and southern kingdoms, even until today, does not and never has included pariah. Rav, or, or teacher, plainly states the commandment of Pariah was not given to the patriarch Abraham. So there is a website where you can go and read a little further, or you can just look um, up some other sources as well. But be it known that the circumcisions that happened in the hospitals are not the one that Yahuwah said to do on the eighth day of life. But anyway, today we are talking about what does it mean to be born again? What does it mean to be born again? Such an esoterical sounding statement the Messiah made to Joseph of Arimathea. What did he mean? It never made much sense. Most believe it means that they are sealed for salvation. And I do not doubt that. But what does it mean to be born again? How do we become born again? I remember as a Christian, as a Gentile Christian, hearing often some statements such as, you might not feel any different, but you have been born again. Is that true? Is it really such that we won't absolutely understand and recognize that something inside us has gone through a change? It's just going to be blind belief kind of a thing, and that's going to be good enough. We just have to know that we know, and that's how we know. Personally, I was never comfortable with this kind of reasoning, this kind of go away kid. I already told you so. By the way, some of this I have, I have received from a brother and I have shared some of this and much more of this is mine. So this part here is some of what he has shared and I'm, I'm very appreciative for that. All that ill-fitting feeling suddenly evaporated for me when I, recently I read a post by Torah Thumper, that's the brother's name. He was able to answer this question so plainly for me. In fact, I had actually had the experience he was describing, and so I knew it was absolutely accurate. I knew that he was correct. To be born again is to have a rebirth. It is a change of identity and a change of heredity. To be born again is to come out of one kingdom and to enter a new kingdom. It is coming out of darkness and entering the light. When we are born again, we take on a new citizenship. This new citizenship includes new laws, at least new from our Gentile mindset. To be born again is to put the old Gentile to death and to be resurrected as the seed of Abraham. Galatians 3.29 to be born again is to begin a life of mind renewal. I'm just going to go ahead and read Galatians 3.29 since I have my scriptures right here. And if you are of Mashiach, then you are seed of Abraham and heirs according to promise. 
Most Christians look at the born-again experience as purely esoteric in nature. It is an inner change of the heart and or spirit. Most believers consider themselves to be saved Gentiles, and has that ever led to some ab abominable doctrines? To most Christians, to be born again is a spiritual rebirth alone. That's how they see it. Scripture paints a vastly different picture of the born-again experience. When one takes all the scriptures as evidence, the born-again experience is one of body, mind, and spirit. Paul's words in Galatians 3.29, which we just read, are not to be seen in the esoteric realm alone. When we are born again, we go through a miraculous metamorphosis. The Gentile identity, or goy, is what it is called in Hebrew, among the nations of those not keeping the everlasting covenant of Yahuwah. Um, this Gentile identity is put to death. The Gentile or Pharisaic mentality is changed to a Hebraic, scriptural, all of the book, not the last one-third of it, mentality. This, of course, requires unlearning a lifetime of error and religiosity. This change is difficult for believers who are under the shadow of a Gentile-minded pastor and or teacher who are goy shepherds, those who do not keep the everlasting covenant of Yahuwah. To be born again is not a come as you are, stay as you are proposition. Being born again is all about change and restoration as it is written. And this is Yashayahu, which means the salvation of Yahuwah, also known as Isaiah, chapter 58, verse 12. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repair of the breach, the restore of paths to dwell in. Yermiyahu, exaltation of Yahuwah is what that book means, and we know it as Jeremiah. 6 verse 16 thus said yahuwah stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where is the good way and walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls christianity in the grand six thousand year old scheme of things is a new thing a new path and a new foundation but the born again person is to seek the old paths of righteousness and the old foundation of the true scriptural belief that foundation is the word of Yahuwah, and whether one is talking about Torah or Yahushua, the word cannot be divided. Yahushua is the word, the Torah made flesh, and he offered us a renewed covenant. What is said about the born-again experience? Let's pull this up a little bit. Ephesians 2, 10 through 12. For we are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yahushua, unto good works, which Elohim prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that you once Gentiles, goyim, those not keeping the everlasting covenant in, in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Messiah, Yehushua, excluded from the citizenship of Yashareel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no expectation and without Elohim in the world. But now in Messiah, Yehushua, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Messiah. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of Elohim. And let's have a study through Romans 9, because it seems that many live like Esau, but want the blessing of Jacob or Yashareel. Well, we were chosen and called out, but few have come out. So let's think on these things and on what it means to be born again as we read this chapter. Romans 9. I speak the truth in Messiah. I do not lie. My conscience also bearing me witness in the set-apart spirit that I have great sadness and continual grief in my heart. For I myself could have wished to be banished from Messiah, for the sake of my brothers, my relatives according to the flesh, who are Yasharalim or Yisraelites, whose is the adoption and the esteem and the covenants and the giving of the Torah and the worship and the promises, whose are the fathers, and from whom is the Messiah according to the flesh, who is over all, Elohim, blessed forever. Amen. However, it is not as though the word of Elohim has failed, 
for they are not all Yisrael who are of Yisrael, neither are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Yitzhak your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of Elohim, but the children of the promise are reckoned as the seed. For this is the word of promise, at this time I shall come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but Ribka or Rebekah, having conceived by one our father Yitzhak, Yet before they were born or had done any good or evil, in order that the purpose of Elohim according to choice might stand, not of works, but of him who calls, it was said to her, The greater shall serve the lesser. As it has been written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. What then shall we say? Is there unrighteousness with Elohim? Let it not be. For he says to Moshe, I shall, I shall favor whomever I favor, and I shall have compassion on whomever I have compassion. So then it is not of him who is wishing, nor of him who is running, but of Elohim who shows favor. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this same purpose I have raised you up to show my power in you, and that my name be declared in all the earth. So then he favors whom he wishes, and he hardens whom he wishes. Then you shall say to me, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his counsel? But who are you, O man, to talk back to Elohim? Shall that which is formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have authority over the clay for the same lump to make one vessel for value and another not for value? And if Elohim, desiring to show wrath and to make his power known, which with much patience tolerated the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his esteem on vessels of compassion, which he had prepared beforehand for esteem, even whom he called, not only us of the Yahudim, but also of the Gentiles, or the, goy, the Goyim. As he says in Hosea too, I shall call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall be in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living Elohim. And Yeshayahu cries out on behalf of Yashareel, Though the number of the children of Yashareel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant shall be saved. For he is bringing a matter to an end and is cutting it short in righteousness because Yahuwah shall cut short a matter on the earth. And as Yeshayahu said before, if Yahuwah Zabaot had not left us a seed, we would have become like Saddam and we would have been made like Amora or Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That Gentiles or Goyim, not following after righteousness, have obtained righteousness even the righteousness of belief. But Yashareel, following after the Torah of righteousness, has not arrived at the Torah of righteousness. Why? Because it was not of belief, but as by works of Torah. For they stumbled at the stone of stumbling. And as it has been written, See, I lay in Sion, a st stone of stumbling, and a rock that makes for falling. And everyone who is believing on him shall not be put to shame. And let's look at First Kepha or First Peter, chapter one. Kepha, an emissary of Yehushua, Hamashiach, to the chosen strangers of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of Elohim the Father, set apart by the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Yehushua. Messiah, favor and peace be increased to you. Blessed be the Elohim and Father of our Master Yehushua HaMashiach, who according to his great compassion has caused us to be born again to a living expectation through the resurrection of Yehushua Messiah from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and unfading, having been kept in the heavens for you, who are protected by the power of Elohim through belief for deliverance ready to be revealed in the last time, in which you exult, even though for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved 
by manifold trials, in order that the proving of your belief, much more precious than gold that perishes and proven by fire, might be found to result in praise and respect and esteem at the revelation of Yehushua HaMashiach, whom having not seen you love, in whom you exult with unspeakable and esteemed joy, yet not seeing but believing, obtaining the goal of your belief, a deliverance of lives. Concerning this deliverance, the prophets have sought out and searched out, prophesying concerning the favor for you, searching to know what or what sort of time the spirit which was in them was pointing out concerning Hamashiach, when it was bearing witness beforehand the sufferings of Ma Messiah, Mashiach, and the esteems that would follow, to whom it was revealed that they were serving not themselves but you in these matters which now have been announced to you through those who brought the good news to you by the set-apart spirit sent from heaven into which messengers long to look into. Therefore, having girded up the loins of your mind, being sober, set your expectation perfectly upon the favor that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Yehushua HaMashiach. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust in your ignorance, instead as the one who called you is set apart. As the one who called you is set apart, so you also should become set apart in all behavior. Because it has been written, Be set apart, for I am set apart. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, pass the time of your sojourning in fear, knowing that you were redeemed from your futile way of life, inherited from your fathers, not with what is corruptible, silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Mashiach, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, Foreknown indeed before the foundation of the world, but manifested in these t last times for your sakes, who through him believe in Elohim, who raised him from the dead and gave him esteem so that your belief and expectation are in Elohim. Now that you have cleansed your lives in obeying the truth through the Spirit to unfeigned brotherly love, love one another fervently with a clean heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the living word of Elohim, which remains forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the esteem of man as the flower of grass, the grass withers and its flower falls away, but the word of Elohim remains forever. And this is the word announced as good news to you. So um, 1 Peter 1, 23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the living word of Elohim, which remains forever. And let's go back at, and look at what Shaul, um, also known as Paul, was referring to about that stumbling stone. This is from Yahshayahu, or the salvation of Yahuwah, also known as Isaiah chapter 8. Yahshayahu is saying to the enemies of the people of Yahuwah, as well as to the people of Yahuwah. He's talking to two different groups of people. Let me take a quick drink of water. Sorry. Verse 9. This is um, chapter 8, Yashayahu, chapter 8, verse 9. Be shattered, O you peoples, and be broken in pieces. Give ear, all you from the far pla places of the earth. Gird yourselves, but be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, but be broken in pieces. Take counsel, and it comes to nothing, to naught. Speak a word, and it does not stand, for El is with us. For Yahuwah spoke thus to me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Yahuwah of hosts, him you shall set apart. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a set-apart place, but a stone of stumbling and a rock that makes for falling to both the houses of Yasharel, as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and snared and taken. Bind up the witness, seal the Torah among my taught ones. 
stumbling stone and a rock of offense to both the houses of Yasharel. So this is for the 10 northern tribes and for the southern tribes that were with um, Yehuda, called the house of Yehuda. So when I was going to church and growing up, I was always taught that the Jews didn't see the Messiah. But how did we stumble over the Messiah? What did we miss because of him? How did we misinterpret or how were we falsely taught something having to do with his coming? We missed the Torah. That's what it was. The witness was bound up. So we're talking about right here. It says, bind up the witness and seal the Torah among my taught ones. The witness was bound up. The Torah was sealed among you who was taught ones. Those who are not taught do not have the precious Torah. When we were ignorant, we were taught to not want it. We were taught to despise it. Oh, that works. Oh, you've gone back to the Torah. You have rejected the Messiah. No, the Torah is the written word, the instruction of Yahuwah. It's what being reborn is all about. Yahushua is the living Torah, the living word of Yahuwah Zabaot, his father, Elohim. Yahuwah always preserves his witness and his word. He always has a remnant. What is the witness that was bound up? I think it was his name. But Psalm 119 speaks about the witnesses, his testimonies. It's the same word. Edote. Ayan Dalit Ta Yod. Edote. Psalm 119.2 says, Baruch, or blessed, are those who observe his witnesses. So his name could certainly be a witness against us if how we regard his name. Is it most precious to us or do we make it as a, a mundane, as a piece of paper? Or do we have no regard for it, even as much as we would have for a piece of paper? What are his other witnesses? So we have to deal with how do we treat his name. And let's quickly back up here and see what does Psalm 119 verse 1 say. Baruch are the perfect in the way who walk in the Torot of Yahuwah. Ta, wa, resh, ta, Torot. That's the plural of Torah. Psalm 119, we're looking at this here. This is the Institute for Scripture Research again at BibleHub.com. Blessed are the perfect in the way who walk in the Torah of Yahuwah. Blessed are those who observe his witnesses, who seek him with all the heart. Yea, they shall do no unrighteousness. They shall walk in his ways. You have commanded us to guard your orders diligently. Oh, that my ways were established to guard your laws. Then I would not be ashamed when I look into all your commands. I thank you with uprightness of heart when I learn the right rulings of your righteousness. I guard your laws. Oh, do not leave me entirely. So DeWitt goes on for um, 8 times 22 verses, just more and more of this type of writing. These words show up over and over. What he has here, Torah, commands, laws, orders, ways, right rulings, laws. And here, just so I can, this is a very good translation we're using, but I said it says Torah here, and it says Torah here. This is instruction. This is instructions. In Hebrew, it says instructions. In English, it says instruction. So this is why it's really good for us to learn Hebrew, because we have to be able to discern what our Father actually said. So anyway... I think I've got this written down here about how Psalm 119 is arranged. The first eight verses. In Psalm 119, each eight verses begins with a new letter in the Hebrew Aleph Beit. This set is the Aleph set, so the Torah are the instructions of Yahuwah. Torah is the singular version, but often we see the plural Torah. Even though the English here says Torah, and even though we are most familiar with the word Torah, it actually says Torah here. And instructions, instructions is plural. Instruction is singular, Torah. And that's one of Yahuwah's witnesses, his Torah instructions, and whether or not we regard them. His huke, that's chet kuf yod. There's a chet 
a kuf and a yod, huke, his constitution for us, his prescriptions for us, his enactments, like his appointments, also known as his feast, listed in Wayikra, which means, and he called, it's also known as Leviticus, chapter 23, are his decrees, his statutes, um, these appointments here. Um, let me just say, what I meant to say is in Wayikra, chapter 23, are his appointments or his feast. But this word huke continues to mean past appointments. It means his decrees, his statutes, his laws, his rules, his prescribed portions, his prescribed do something for us that he's appointed for us. His huke have to do with imitating him, imitating Yahuwah, and his engraving his image into us that we honestly and fully represent his statutes and laws for us, similar to how we raise our children and we give them boundaries as to how they must behave in our family and they are to grow up. Yahuwah gave me a visual on this. It's the song from the movie Hook, and it goes like this. Hook, hook, show us the hook. Hook, hook, give us the hook. But raised as Christians, we did not want the hook. We were taught to stay far away from this. We did not want the precious prescribed portion of the children of Yasharael. But that did not happen on accident. That was the work of Constantine and the Council of Nicaea. Um, you can do a lot of research on Constantine and look up his creed. Um, we, as, as our ancestors were originally brought into the belief of Yahushua as our Messiah, we were trained by the house of Yehuda to keep the Torah. And Constantine was not happy about this at all. He wanted to unite his empire. He wanted to separate uh, what was called the Nazarim, which has since been called Christians. Uh, but they were the sect that Paul led, which was called the Nazarim. And so Constantine did a great deal of death blows to separate our ancestors from keeping the Torah. So you can do a lot of research on that, Constantine's Creed, uh, when was the Passover changed, or not the Passover, Passover to Easter is what I'm thinking, um, and when was the Shabbat changed, and everything that we did, that we did right alongside with Brother Yehuda, we had to then no longer do. We had to denounce them and embrace what Constantine was enforcing. That's what our ancestors had to do. So this was the work of Constantine and the Council of Nicaea, um, the Catholic Church and the daughters thereof, the Protestant churches it eventually is what all that turned out to. However many thousands of thousands of Christian churches, um, this is all part of them being the daughter of this, this um, Babylonian whore church to separate us out into a new religion that did not follow the precepts of Yahuwah. Well, let's look at a video. I was gonna show this video, but just because of um, any sort of copyright issues, I tried to put all the information here for the video, but I just decided if you're on my Facebook page, you can click on this and it's a live link. It'll take you right over to it. Um, and you can definitely, I'll try to leave um, the address link in the description so you can go and see this video. It's very uh, clever. It's very cute. It's from the movie Hook, as it says here, directed by Steven Spielberg in 1991. The music video is shared by Thomas Laughlin in April 2013. It has Robin Williams, Julia Roberts, and Bob Hoskins in it, who plays Shmi. And so here they're singing as they're following Shmi with this red pillow with the hook on it. And they're singing, hook, hook, show us the hook, 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 give us the hook. So it's a play on words for us, but to help us to understand that this was Yahuwah's constitution for the people. It was his precepts, his statutes. What, what are the other words that it is used in the definition here? If we go back, I'm sure we're going to hit it again. His laws, his rules, his prescribed portions. Um, appointments, which would include his feast, 
And then it was him basically engraving his image into us or the potter turning, turning the pottery into the shape that he wanted it and turning us into his, him, his image. But it's a great little video. It's only a minute or two, so I would encourage you to go check it out. It's certainly a lot of fun, and, and a lot of people really enjoyed that movie and enjoyed the song. Whenever you think of this movie, I hope you will think of this song and that the people of Yahuwah and Dawid, or we knew him as David, Dawid says in Psalm 119, verse 8, I guard your hooke, your hooks, I guard your hooks. Your constitution, your prescriptions, your enactments, your decrees, your statutes, your laws, your rule, your prescribed portion, your prescribed due. I imitate you and participate fully in your engraving your image into me that I might represent your statutes and laws for us in a trustworthy manner. What are his other witnesses? Because Psalm 119 goes on and on about them for 8 times 22 letters worth of verses. In verse 27, Dawid says, Make me understand the way of your pikude. pikude. Um, it almost sounds like a pickle. Uh, pikude, translated as your orders. It has the word pakad in it. So pikude is pekuf. Wa dalit yod. So this is like our P. I'm reading right to left. This is like our P, pay. It means mouth. And then there's kuf, which is the eye of the noodle, the needle. Eye of the needle, not eye of the noodle. Um, and that's like our Q. You could almost see a Q shape, like a O and, a, and something coming down from it, like this one here. You can also almost see a Q shape over here. And then there's here's the wa, which is a hook or a nail, and something to connect two things. And um, like if you, if you nail one board to another, you're connecting those two boards. You're fastening them. You're holding them tight together. And then this is a dollet, or uh, that's like our D right here, D. This is almost like a mirror here between the two words. And then there's a yod. Uh, which is right here. It's represented by a Y in English. Okay, so pakad, it has the word pakad in it. Pe, or mouth. Kuf, which is the eye of the needle. And dalit, which is a door. Pakad means to visit. So remember that pakude means, it's translated as your orders, but pakad, which is in the word, means to visit with friendly or hostile intent. So sometimes Yahuwah will talk about, in that day that I visit you, and he means business. It's not like, oh, we'll sit down and have tea. It's not like that at all. Um, so it can be friendly or hostile intent. It also means it's to oversee, to muster, to charge, to care for, to deposit, to number, to visit, to be concerned with, hence to oversee to look after, to make a search for, to punish, and to miss. The first occurrence of this word, pakad, is in Genesis 21.1. Yahuwah visited Sarah to intervene on behalf of, so as to demonstrate the divine intervention in the normal course of events to bring about or fulfill a divine intent, often by miraculous means. And that's from the Strong's Concordance with the Hebrew Aramaic Dictionary. Many of us have them. It's, it's uh, an impressive source, resource. Um, and we have several other uh, classical and etymological dictionaries here. And sometimes a word won't be in one of them and we'll find it in another one. And sometimes we have to break down the word letter by letter and look at the meanings of each of the letters. But I, I'm, I'm often very impressed with the Strong's Concordance even though it's done to the King James and, and the names are wrong, but it's still, it's still a good source. In verse 20, DeWid says, See, I have longed for your pikude. In verse 45, DeWid says, For I have sought your pikude. So he's longing for them and he's seeking after them. Your orders, that I might speak of your witnesses before sovereigns. So he's seeking for something from Yahuwah so he can speak of this witness and his other witnesses before kings 
Translated as orders, yet it looks to me that there is a divine significance to searching for Yahuwah's orders. He's searching. And where would he be searching? He would be searching the word, or DeWitt would be searching the Tanakh, the, from Genesis all the way to the, the books that were written while he was living, certainly. What else are his witnesses, Yahuwah's witnesses? Mishpat. In verse 43, DeWitt says, And do not take away from my mouth the word of truth entirely, for I have waited for your mishpat. It is translated as right rulings. So it'll say, for I have waited for your right rulings. But in the dictionary, mishpat means judgment, the seat of judgment. It means cause, case, suit, sentence, justice, right, ordinance, decision, due, privilege, sentence, and verdict. These look very much like court of law concepts, innocent slash guilty verdict stuff. At the end of a court case about oneself in front of the judge, this is a very sobering and fearful word. Without our Messiah, Yahushua, it would be a sentence of death. Certainly, with, help, with him, we are told to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But David is saying, I have waited for your mishpat. He's comfortable with this idea and he's excited about it. Another M word that is a witness is the mitzwote. Mem, zadi, wa, ta, yod. Translated as your commands. As Christians, we were taught to disregard the commands of Yahuwah, that they were nailed to the cross. Hallelujah. But here, King Dawid, the one who it is said was after Yahuwah's own heart, has written this psalm. Let's look at the eight verses that begin with the Hebrew letter Wa. Wa is a hook, a nail, a connector that connects two things. Here is the Wa section. Wa also is a prefix that means and, that, so, yet. So we'll see those words in this section beginning um, this section, each of the because wa is a prefix. And we're going to zoom in on, on verse 47, where it is translated as your commands, this word mitzvote. It means your commands, but it also means your strife, your quarrel, your contention. Dawid delighted himself in the contention, the strife, the quarrel, the commands of Yahuwah. It sounds like he engaged in battle against all who would contend with Yahuwah's commands. And of course, further reading shows that DeWitt did just that. He came against all who were against the commands of Yahuwah and called them wicked. So here we have this portion of Psalm 119. And this is the letter Wa. So this would have been part of the letter He. And this is part of the letter um, Zion, the seventh letter. So here we see it start, we got the words and, so, that, and these, these are prefixes on other words. And let your kindnesses come to me, O Yahuwah, your deliverance according to your word, so that I answer my reprover, for I have trusted in your word. And do not take away from my mouth the word of truth entirely, for I have waited for your right rulings, that I might guard your Torah continually forever and ever that I might walk in a broad place, for I have sought your orders, that I might speak of your witnesses before sovereigns and not be ashamed, that I might delight myself in your commands, which I have loved, that I might lift up my hands to your commands, which I have loved, while I meditate on your laws. So verse 48 goes on to say, that I might lift up my mitzvoteka, your commands, that I might lift up my hands to your mitzvoteka. I'm missing the word hands here. To uh, mitzvoteka, your commands, but also your quarrel. So he's lifting up his hands to his quarrel, his strife, his contention. You know, uh, Dawid, the king, is lifting up his hands to do battle, to praise Yahuwah through it, but to get in there and work at it. Um, with his quarrel, his strife, his contention, and his commands, which he has loved, he says. While I meditate on your hookay, your hook, your constitution, your prescriptions, 
your enactments, your decrees, your statutes, your laws, your rule, your prescribed portion, your prescribed due. I imitate you and participate fully in your engraving your image into me that I might represent your statutes and laws for us in a trustworthy manner. This is one reason. Do I have the right one? I do. I really enjoy this um, this interlinear. It's got the Hebrew and the English. So I can look up these words in uh, Psalm 119. Let me see if my Psalm, if I think this is the version that I did it in. Oh my, yes it is. Um, I'll show you just a this is this is what I was studying, and this is this goes on for like four pages, four pages of going through these same words of witnesses that we're going through. So, hopefully, you can see the Hebrew and the English here, so that I can look up each word and make some notes. There's the last page. It went on many verses. Immediately after verse 48, we're in the Zion letters here. I think we've got it down here. Here we go. Immediately after verse 48, we're in the Zion letters, letter verses. Zion is a tool and it is a weapon. Look here for concepts of punishment or ridicule or persecution or tools being used to deal with those things. What the righteous does to counteract acts of aggression or violence. Those types of concepts. We see the Zion verses in blue here. And the following eight verses are the Chet verses, which is fencing in or keeping out. Remember the word to your servant on which you have caused me to wait. This is my comfort in my affliction. For your word has given me life. The proud have utterly scorned me. I did not turn aside from your Torah. I remembered your right rulings of old, O Yahuwah, and I comfort myself. Rage has seized me because of the wrong who forsake your Torah. Your laws have been my songs in the place of my sojournings. I have remembered your name in the night, O Yahuwah, and I guard your Torah. This has become mine because I have observed your orders. So let's look at this real quick. Um, so, your word has given me life. And then we have your Torah in this line. We have your right rulings in this line. That's Mishpat. Torah's Torah. Um, and then we have Torah again in this line. And then uh, your laws. Um, I think this is probably the word huke, but I, I can look it up. I have remembered your name in the night. So here we're talking about his name. I think that's another one of his witnesses and we need to do business with his name. It is very important. Um, and again, Torah. And then we have your orders. And this was that word um, mitzvot. So let's look at verse 51. The proud have scorned me. I did not turn aside from your Torah. Again, it is plural. It means your instructions. This is why it's important again to begin to learn Hebrew so we can see and learn what words Yahuwah actually put into his word. To code searcher, it matters whether this word ends in a ta or in a hey. Words encoded here must have a ta, not a hey. So it matters how words are spelled and what codes might be found here. And then I also might mention here um, to, I would recommend highly to learn Paleo Hebrew from Eric Bissell. He has his Paleo uh, Hebrew program freely available on YouTube. It's approximately a college level class. Take notes as if you're going to be tested and stuff. You'll learn so much. I ended up transcribing several of the first few letters and it, it was where I had practically memorized it and I made lots of notes I took lots of screenshots I just there's so much to learning like when we're preschool children and we're learning a new language we work with colors um, we might we might have 
big letters on papers and glue beans to it. And if you've had any experience taking children to preschool or if you can remember preschool um, or even see preschool videos, there's a lot of that sort of reinforcement of different, uh, working with different mediums, um, counting things, different colors, making shapes, building things gluing and putting yarn on letters. So Eric uses a color system with the letters and he's just such a humble and amazing teacher. I highly recommend him, but please use the pause button if he gets ahead of your ability to keep up with him. It, you just don't want to miss anything because it's pretty amazing stuff he shares. Verse 52, I remembered your mishpate, that's judgment, seat of judgment, cause, case, suit, sentence, justice, right, ordinance, decision, due, privilege, sentence, verdict. These look very much like court of law concepts. Innocent, guilty, verdict stuff at the end of a court case, oneself in front of the judge. We need to remember this court case for our very soul's existence. Um, I might also mention here while we're here, I'm taking a break between these verses. <laughs> um, somebody recently put a comment on one of Jonathan's videos that why couldn't he put English words when he finds it in Hebrew and um, Louis Vega does that for Jonathan and it's just so wonderful that he does that after the fact but he, all this right here is the definition for mishpat <laughs> you got four letters mem, shin, pe, ta all of this is what mishpat is. How are you going to put that in a little tiny line? It, it's really hard to do that. And it's hard to, it's hard to convey the meaning, the depth of the meaning, and which meaning might it mean out of all of those. And maybe rob some of the opportunity to meditate on it by just throwing one word up there. What if you pick the wrong word? What if Jonathan's doing a code search and he thinks that it means... Um, sentence but it means privilege or he thinks it means ordinance and it means judgment and he writes ordinance but it really was judgment so it's it's very difficult to confine Yahuwah to our English language so it's good to know and to be able to meditate on it and and not try to put it all in a little box because they're tiny little little areas where you'd have to label it um, so we go with our best understanding of it, but gee, look how big this meaning is for this word mishpat. So we get more of a sense of what the word means. Verse 54, your laws, your huke, have been, have been my songs in the place of my sojournings. How many of us have, have had Yahuwah's laws be our songs? But this is how DeWid felt about it. Huke your constitution, your prescriptions, your enactments, your decrees, your statutes, your laws, your rule, your prescribed portion, your prescribed due. I imitate you and participate fully in your engraving, your image into me, that I might represent your statutes and laws for us in a trustworthy manner. That's what hooke means. Uh, Eric Bissell does, does a thing about this word hook, which is a which is a chet and a kuf, and this yod means my my hook. Um, he does a thing about the hokey pokey, so it's hulk or hook, and he does a thing about hokey pokey. You put your your right hand in, you put your right hand out, you put your right hand in, and you shake it all about. You do the hokey pokey, and that's what it's all about. Turn yourself around, all that. Definitely, we're turning ourselves around. This is a turning around, by the way, from the way we came about. So Hokey Pokey is a really good song also. Who has given us some hooks that we can grab into what he's sharing and teaching us? It's not like we're starting from zero. We're assimilating new knowledge into experiences we've already had. We all know Yahoo.com, so we can all say Yahuwah. It's not that hard. Um, 
He gives us hooks that we can we can grasp and we can grab onto and we can attach things to into our brain. Um, so the hokey pokey is another good one. It's about do what I do and follow me and turn around and come this way. And imitation, there again, imitate. And I think those are his right rulings, his instructions, Torah, his pikud, but let's keep reading. Uh, these are but a, a small collection of verses regarding the born again experience, which is an experience that redeems us from the identity of Gentiles who are strangers and aliens. Gentiles are in Hebrew is goyim. And they are those who do not keep the everlasting covenant. They are in the nations that sometimes it's translated nations, but these nations also do not keep the everlasting covenant. So, um, so this collection of verses regarding the born again experience, um, which is an experience that redeems us from the identity of being Gentiles. It takes us out of that identity strangers and aliens from Yahuwah's people and crowns us with the identity as sons and daughters, fellow citizens in Yasharael, members of the covenants, this is plural, of Elohim. We must cross over from the matrix Babylonian beast system of comfort and temporary convenience and boy, uh, entertainment, uh, news organizations that spoon feed us what we're supposed to think about what we're not supposed to think about and great sins flaunted in the face of yahuwah and asked for the ancient past we must come out of all that we that we must come out of all that be born out of it we must be delivered from it we must be born again crossed over from the world's ways of doing things to yahuwah's ways Yehushua did not bring a different way. He just brought himself as a Yeshua, a rescue, a deliverance for how we fell short and the punishment that we earned for ourselves. He's the one, the Mashiach, the Messiah that makes the, that mishpat, that judge, judgment, law, room, court case thing, not so eternally damning for ourselves. The ancient past, thus says Yahuwah, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient way is. For the, I'm sorry, let me start over. I messed a line. The ancient past, thus says Yahuwah, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient past where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for yourselves. But they said, we will not walk in it. That's Jeremiah 6.16. So Yahu, the prophet, prophesies that we or our ancestors said we will not walk in it walk in the ancient past well most will not walk in it uh, but those in the great chapter of belief hebrews 11 the hall of belief they did leave the comfort of what they knew and followed and trusted yahuwah it says they were looking for the city whose builder was yahuwah most stay on the wide path don't study the word of yahuwah Definitely won't look into the Old Testament for the instructions, the right rulings, the commandments and orders of Yahuwah, but the remnant shall, they will, and they do. They are, they already are. Yahushua said he came only for the lost sheep of Yasharel, Matthew 15, 24. And Yahushua went out from there and withdrew to the parts of Zor and Sidon and see a woman of Canaan came from those borders and cried out to him saying have compassion on me O master son of dawid my daughter is badly demon possessed but he did not answer her a word and his taught ones came and asked him saying send her away because she cries after us and he answering said i was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of yasharel but she came and was bowing to him saying master help me and he answering said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. But she said, Yes, master, for even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And Yahushua answering said to her, O woman, your belief is great. Let it be to you as, your, as you desire. And, his, and her daughter was healed from that hour. 
So here the point, the important thing here is that Yahushua said he was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Yasharel. And in um, John 10, he also was sending his disciples to the lost sheep of the house of Yasharel. Paul makes it abundantly clear in Romans 9 that we are the house of Ephraim, who was prophesied in Genesis 48:19 to be Milo Hagoim, the fullness of the Gentiles, those not keeping the everlasting covenant. In actuality, those of the lost sheep of Yasharel, who Yahushua came for, as Yahuwah prophesied to Yehuda in anger against the southern tribe, because they did not look, go looking for their brother. When Yahuwah I misspelled this. When Yahuwah cast the ten northern hidden tribes, known both as the house of Yashorel and the house of Ephraim, out of the covenant, they became Gentiles, or Goyim, and lost their Hebrew identity. This is a very big part of what the restoration is all about. And though Yahushua came 2,000 years ago, there was a curse of 2,730 years that just ended in 2009-2010. And so that is why there's been this huge restoration move. And these are the things Yahuwah is restoring to him, us. His name, his son's name, um, his people, the 12 tribes. He's bringing them all back to be a, a group of one. He talks in Ezekiel, I think it's 37. He talks about having the stick of Ephraim and the stick of Yehuda in his hand. And they become one stick. Um, there's restoration of his language. It talks about in Zephaniah or Zephaniah. That Zephan means the hidden. Um, it also means north. But the hidden or the secret of Yah talks about in chapter 3, verse 9, the restoration of the pure language to his people so that they may serve him with one shoulder. There will be no more this and that dis difference. Uh, they'll all be doing the same thing with one shoulder. They will serve him. Uh, what else? There's going to be a return to the land. There's also going to be a second exodus. Um, what else is he restoring? Oh, his calendar. He's restoring his calendar. It's not the man-made beast system calendar that's uh, here for the greed of men in high positions to control everybody. So they're all working Monday to Friday and they have Saturday and Sunday off. Um, He's restoring his Moedim, his appointments. Those are listed in um, Yikra, which is the book of Leviticus. It means, and he called. And it's uh, in chapter 23. So if you want to know how to uh, keep Passover, it's there. Um, if you want to know how to keep uh, Yom Kippur, it's there. It's called Yom Ha Kippurim. has to do with lots like Purim, if you've heard of Purim. This is a very big part of what the restoration is all about. This uh, crossing over, this born again for sure, um, crossing over from the things that we have known to the ways of Yahuwah. All those that came out of the Egyptian um, slavery there, they had to cross over from the ways they were used to doing things, even though they were slaves, to the way Yahuwah does things. His Shabbat, um, his appointments, what they could eat, what they could not eat. Leviticus 11 tells us what we can eat and what we can't eat. Um, let's look at Romans 9 and read it. It concerns us and by great measure, measures by evil men in high positions who sought to steal from us our identity and thereby our power and thereby control us for their own evil greed and gain our identity and how to be born again has been hidden from us. I'm going to grab a drink of water again. It's very stormy here today, and the clouds are so low and very gray and heavy looking. But the grass is very green below it. Crops are getting ready to come up. Romans chapter 9. Verse 1, I speak the truth in Mashiach, I do not lie, my conscience also bearing me witness in the set-apart spirit that I have great sadness and continual grief in my heart, for I myself could have wished to be banished from Mashiach for the sake of my brothers, my relatives, according to the flesh, who are Yasharalim, 
whose is the adoption and the esteem and the covenants and the giving of the Torah and the worship and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Mashiach according to the flesh who is over all, Elohim blessed forever, amen. However, it is not as though the word of Elohim has failed for they are not all Yashorael who are of Yashorael. Neither are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Yitzhak your seed shall be called. This is those who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of Elohim, but the children of the promise are reckoned as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I shall come and Sarah shall have a son. I know we've already read this, but we're going to read it again. And not only so, but Ribka, having conceived by one, our father Yitzhak, Yet before they were born or had done any good or evil in order that the purpose of Elohim according to choice might stand not of works but of him who calls. It was said to her, the greater shall serve the lesser as it has been written, Yaakov I have loved but Esau I have hated. What then shall we say? Is there unrighteousness with the Elohim? Let it not be. For he says to Moshe, I shall favor whom I, whomever I favor and I shall have compassion on whomever I have compassion. So then it is not of him who is wishing, nor of him who is running, but of Elohim who shows favor. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this same purpose I have raised you up to show my power in you and that my name be declared in all the earth. So then he favors whom he wishes and he hardens whom he wishes. Then you shall say to me, why does he still find fault for who has resisted his counsel? But who are you, O man, to talk back to Elohim? Shall that which is formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have authority over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for value and another not for value? And if Elohim desiring to show wrath and to make his power known, which with much patience tolerated the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction and that he might make known the riches of his esteem on vessels of compassion, which he had prepared beforehand for esteem, even whom he called not only us of the Yehudim, but also of the Gentiles. And he says in Hosea 2, I shall call them my people who were not my people and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall be in, that, in the place where it was said to them, you were not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living El Elohim. And Yeshayahu cries out on behalf of Yashorael, though the number of the children of Yashorael be as the sand of the sea, the remnant shall be saved. For he is bringing a matter to an end and is cutting it short in righteousness because Yahuwah shall cut short a matter on the earth. And as Yashayahu said before, if Yahuwah of hosts, Yahuwah Zabaot, had not left us a seed, we would have become like Saddam and we would have been made like Amora. What shall we say then? That Gentiles not following after righteousness have obtained righteousness, even the righteousness of belief. But Yashorael following after the Torah of righteousness has not arrived at the Torah of righteousness. Why? Because it was not of belief, but as by works of Torah. For they stumbled at the stone of stumbling. As it has been said, see, I lay in Sion a stone of stumbling and a rock that makes for falling, and every one who is believing on him shall not be put to shame. Peter declares we were born again by the word of Yahuwah, and if he, his manifested word abides in us through Yahushua, Hamashiach, the Messiah, then his written word should also abide in us. We are Hebrews, children of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Our mighty one is the Elohim of Yashorael, our Messiah is Hamashiach, the Messiah of Yashorael, and our future hope is the restoration of the kingdom of Yahuwah, which will include the restoration of the kingdom of Yashorael. If you are born again, you are no longer a Gentile, a Goy. My friend, you and I are both physically and spiritually the seed of Abraham, of Yitzhak, and of Yaakov. If you have sat through this message, I believe Yahuwah will hold you accountable to study it out, examine it. In order to do that, you are going to need a restored name translation because Yahuwah's name and his son's name were removed from most English translations. 
Order yourself a Hallelujah Scriptures. I highly recommend the English, Hebrew, interlinear translation, which I held up. We also have the large print edition, which does not have the Hebrew in it. And we have a waterproof edition, which is good for if you live near the water. Also good choices. But even if you cannot afford the donation to receive your copy, and even if you do, anyone with internet access can go to to Bible Hub and select the ISR Institute for Scripture Research version. There is also a restored name King Jimmy version, but I don't recommend it. Um, it's it's okay, but there's still a lot of mistakes in the King Jimmy version. You need to know about the name Yahuwah and what he says about his name. You need to know about the only name under heaven by which we can be saved, Yahushua. Let's just grab that real quick from Acts 4. Let's see if I can get all this on here at one time. There we go. And it came to be on the next day that their rulers and elders and scribes assembled in Yerushalayim, as well as Hanan, the high priest, and Caiapha and Yohanan and Alexander, and as many as were high priestly descent. And having placed them in the middle, they asked, By what power or in what name did you do this? Then Kepha, filled with the set-apart spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if today we are called to account for a good deed towards a sick man by whom he has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Yashrael that the name of Yahushua, Messiah of Nazareth, whom you impaled, whom Elohim raised from the dead, by him this one stands before you healthy. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. So here we're talking about that rejection of the house of Yehuda. But then, of course, the house of Yashrael the house of Ephraim also stumbled over the same stone. And there is no deliverance in anyone else, for there is no other name under the heaven given among men by which we need to be saved. And seeing the boldness of Kepha and Yohanan, and perceiving that they were unlearned and ordinary men, they marveled, and they recognized that they had been with Yehushua. And seeing the man whom had been healed standing with them, they could not contradict it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they consulted one with one another, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that an outstanding miracle has been done through them is apparent to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, and we are unable to deny it. They really wanted to cover it up. But in order that it spreads no further among the people, let us strongly threaten them. Sorry. Let us strongly threaten them to speak no more to anyone in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Yehushua. But Kepha, or Peter, and Yohanan, or John, answering them said, Whether it is right in the sight of Elohim to listen to you more than to Elohim you judge, for it is impossible for us not to speak of what we saw and heard. So there you have it. You need to reckon with the lies that you were told, as we all do, as we were all told lies. Yahuwah knows about them. He knows what bag of lies we inherited. Yermiyahu, or Jeremiah 16, says, Therefore see, the days are coming, declares Yahuwah, when it is no longer said, Yahuwah lives, who brought up the children of Yashareel from the land of Mitzrayim, or Egypt. But Yahuwah lives, who brought up the children of Yashrael from the land of the north, the hidden land, and from all the lands where he had driven them. For I shall bring them back into their land I gave to their fathers. See, I am sending for many fishermen, declares Yahuwah, and they shall fish them. And after that I shall send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill, and out of the holes of the rocks. For my eyes are on all their ways. They have not been hidden from my face, nor has their crookedness been hidden from my eyes. And first I shall repay double for their crookedness and their sin, because they have defiled my land with the dead bodies of their disgusting matters, and have filled my inheritance with their abominations. 
O Yahuwah, my strength and my stronghold and my refuge, in the day of distress the Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited our only falsehood, futility, and there is no value in them. Would a man make mighty ones for himself which are not mighty ones? Therefore see, I am causing them to know, this time I cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is Yahuwah. Please study the book of Hosea, also known as Hosea. It was written to us, the house of Ephraim, the ten northern tribes. It is not just a book in the big book, the scriptures. No, it was written to us about our waywardness and our deep sins of pagan idolatry. And also Yahuwah talks about he's bringing us back. He's going to take us to the wilderness and woo us back to them. So like many of Yahuwah's books, uh, and even sometimes chapters, uh, they will talk about his, uh, his anger with us, how we've let him down, how we've been um, untrustworthy in our, in our ancestors' dealings with him and their lack of loyalty to keep the everlasting covenant with him. And then he will talk about how he brings his people back. He will bring the ones who will come back. Um, when, when, if you think about the analogy of Yahuwah sending fishers for us, we can either take the bait, we can grab on that hook and be hooked in uh, by the hook that he gives us, which is his law, his precepts, his statutes, his his covenant um his constitution even we could we could be concerned about the constitution of the united states or we could be concerned about his constitution his hook um or we can say no thank you because he's he is gentle with us in the sense that he honors and respects our ability to choose his way his truth his right ruling, or we can say, no, thank you. Will you like where we're at now? So he does send fishers for us. It's not like he doesn't. He's not like he doesn't call. He is the one who calls. He calls us, and then we decide if we're going to receive his call or not, if we're going to answer appropriately or not. So study the book of Hosea. It was written for us. Also, please see They Have Despised My Name by Followers of Yah. It's a video on YouTube. I think it will great. It greatly helps. It's it's such a good video, and please know that Yahuwah is against God. In Hebrew, it's Gimel Dalit, um, the Babylonian deity of fortune. He does not call himself God. He calls himself Yahuwah Zabaot of Host. He calls himself El Eloha Elohe Elohim. This is from Yashayahu, Salvation of Yahuwah also known as Isaiah chapter 65. Let's look at this chapter real quick. This first 12 verses I think I have. It's hard to get all on here one time. I have let myself be inquired of, not by those who asked. I was found, not by those who sought me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation not calling on my name. He let himself be found by people who do, did not call him by his name, Yahuwah. I have held out my hands all day long to a stubborn people who walk in a way that is not good, after their own thoughts. The people who provoke me continually to my face, who slaughter in gardens and burn incense on altars of brick, who sit among the graves and spend the night in secret places, who eat flesh of pigs and the broth of unclean meat in their, is in their pots, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am set apart to you. These are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day. She's not happy about that. See, it is written before me, I am not silent, but shall repay, and I shall repay into their bosom your crookednesses and the crookednesses of your fathers together, said Yahuwah, who burned incense on the mountains and reproached me on the hills, and I shall measure their former work into their bosom. Thus said Yahuwah, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one shall say, do not destroy it, for there is blessing in it. So I do for my servant's sake, nor to destroy them all. And I shall bring forth a seed from Yaakov. Here we're talking about a remnant. Close up this window a little bit. Okay. 
So I do for my servant's sake, not to destroy them all. And I shall bring forth a seed from Jacob and from Yehuda, an heir of my mountains. And my chosen one shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. Dwell there. And Sharon shall be a fold of flocks, and the valley of Akor a place for herds to lie down, for my people who have sought me. But you are those who forsake Yahuwah, who forget my set-apart mountain, who prepare a table for God, and who fill a drink offering for many, or you might as well say money, it's fate, it's a deity of fate. And I shall allot you to the sword, and let you all bow down to the slaughter, because I called and you did not answer, I spoke and you did not hear, and you did evil before my eyes, and chose that in which I did not delight. Therefore thus said the master Yahuwah, See my servants eat, but you hunger. See my servants drink, but you thirst. See my servants rejoice, but you are put to shame. Verse 11 here, this is, this is God. You say God, God is how you pronounce it. It's not Gad rhyming with glad. I've heard people say that. Oh, that means Gad. No, that's God. This is what the Strong's Concordance defines it as. So we have this, this is God, it's, it's a coriander seed, okay, so if you're, ta if you're speaking Hebrew and you're speaking about coriander seed, you would say God for this coriander seed. Um, and it has to do with its cutting of furrows, because um, there's a lot of language words that have to do with verbs or actions in Hebrew. This God, 1408, is um, fortune a Babylonian deity and it's translated twice as that troop um, in this is the King James concordance I'm almost done um, and this God 1409 is in the sense of distributing fortune um, and this God is a son of Jacob, including his tribe and its territory. And there was also a prophet named God. Um, this is still, when this son was named, he was named after this deity because the mother Leah, her father had deities in, in his home. And so they were familiar with this Babylonian deity of fortune, Chaldean deity. So yes, a tribe is named God. His mother named him after this deity of fortune. Sad for him because wherever there's fortune, there's someone to come in and good. You've heard God is good. Good in Hebrew is a word. It's gimel wa dalit. It would just be like these, but there'd be a wa in between there. But good in Hebrew means to fall upon, attack for the purpose of taking the goods, what stands to be lost. What a person owns, their goods, that's what they stand to lose when somebody mightier than them comes in and takes it but this is a deity of might makes right go in and take what i want because i am mighty this deity is into acquisitions and distributions if you study all the gimel Dalit words in the strong's concordance or any other etymological or classical hebrew dictionary you'll find that the gimel Dalit words have to do with this acquisition and deity and elevating oneself um, like the, the high priest is the Kohen Hagadol. It's got that Gimel Dalit, Lamed. Um, it's, it's the height. It's, it's a height. Um, he cannot heal. This deity cannot heal. He can only be about mammon. He has a stronghold in this country and is on the lips of virtually every English-speaking person every day. Just try to give him up. It is a battle. It's a stronghold in this country. And you'll see if you decide that you want to take the, the name off your lips and just call on Yahuwah, it, it'll be a battle. It's not an over, it's just like any, if you decide you're not going to say dang, if, you, if you've got a habit of saying dang or some other slangy kind of word like that, and you decide, okay, I'm not going to say that anymore. Or maybe, maybe you say cool all the time and you decide, okay, I'm not going to say that anymore. It's, it takes time to train your brain not to say things. And it will be the same with that deity's name. Know these things from the book of Revelation, um, which is the word kazon, which is visions. This is Revelation 7. 
And after this I saw four messengers standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another messenger coming up from the rising of the sun, holding the seal of the living Elohim. And he cried with a loud voice to the four messengers to whom it was given to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our Elohim upon their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed out of all the tribes of the children of Yashorel. Of the tribe of Yehuda, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of God, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Menashe, 12,000 were sealed. Incidentally, according to Stephen Collins, uh, Menashe is the tribe that lives here in the United States of America, and Ephraim is the tribe that lives in Britain and its uh, imperial areas, its colony, colonization places. Of the tribe of Shimon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Lui, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Yisashakar, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Yosef, 12,000 were sealed. This would be Ephraim because we have Benashe just above there. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. And this I, after this I looked and saw a great crowd which no one was able to count out of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb dressed in white robes and palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, Deliverance belongs to our Elohim who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the messengers stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped Elohim saying, Amen, Amen the blessing and the esteem and the wisdom and thanksgiving and the respect and the power and the might to our Elohim forever and ever. Amen. And this is from Revelation 9. And the fifth messenger sounded, and I saw a star from the heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key to the pit of the deep was given to it. And he opened the pit of the deep, and smoke went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun was darkened, also the air, because of the smoke of the pit. And out of the smoke locusts came up upon the earth, and authority was given to them, as the scorpions of the earth possess authority. And it was said to them that they shall not harm the grass of the earth, or any green matter, or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of Elohim upon their foreheads. And it was given to them that they should not kill them, but to torture them for five months, and their torture was like the torture of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days men shall seek death and shall not find it, and they shall long to die, but death shall flee from them. And the locusts looked like horses prepared for battle, and on their heads were crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. And they had the hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth, and they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots, of many horses running into battle. And they have tails like scorpions and stings, and in their tails is their authority to harm men five months. And they have over them a sovereign, the messenger of the pit of the deep, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. The first woe is past. See, two woes are still coming after this. And then run from Revelation 12. And a great sign was seen in the heaven, a woman clad with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And being pregnant, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign was seen in the heaven, and see, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. And his tail draws a third of the stars of the heaven and throws them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she bore a male child who was to shepherd all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught away to Elohim and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by Elohim to be nourished 
there 1,260 days. And there came to be fighting in the heaven. Mikael and his messengers fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his messengers fought. But they were not strong enough, nor was a place found for them in the heaven any longer. And the great dragon was thrown out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who leads all the world astray. He was thrown to the earth, and his messengers were thrown out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in the heaven, Now have come the deliverance, and the power, and the reign of our Elohim, and the authority of his Mashiach, for the accuser of our brothers, who accused them before Elohim day and night, has been thrown down. There's a wilderness event before there's a rapture, in my opinion and understanding. So studying the wilderness experience, you want to get in on that. It involves being brought under the bond of the covenant, and it involves Yahuwah separating the fat sheep from the skinny sheep. I read that the other day. From Revelation 14, um, 12, I think I'm missing a picture here. I'm just going to keep reading in this version. This version and the ISR are very close, but I wanted you to see something else here. Um, just a few more verses here. They, I think I missed a photo I wanted to bring over, so I will put that in, and it'll be in the notes. If you're on my uh, Facebook group, um, you can reach this in my notes, and so uh, otherwise, you can just review it here, but uh, I, I'm just going to read on from uh, verse 11 through 17, the rest of this chapter. And they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their witness, and they did not love their lives to the death. Because of this rejoice, O Shamayim, that's the heavens, and you who dwell in them, woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has little time. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. And the woman was given two wings of a great eagle to fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. And out of his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river after the woman to cause her to be swept away by the river. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the river, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to fight with the remnant of her seed, those guarding the commands of Yahuwah and possessing the witness of Yahushua HaMashiach. Okay, so that was the rest of Revelation 12. And we read about the um, wilderness event there. Revelation 14. And I looked and saw a lamb standing on Mount Sion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written upon their foreheads. And I heard a voice out of the heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a renewed song before the throne, and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one was able to learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. They are those who were not defiled with women, for they are maidens. They are those following the Lamb wherever he leads them on. They were redeemed from among men, being firstfruits to Elohim and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no falsehood, for they are blameless before the throne of Elohim. And I saw another messenger flying in mid-heaven, holding the everlasting good news, the Besorah it's called, to announce to those dwelling on the earth, even to every nation and tribe and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear Elohim and give esteem to him, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heaven and the earth and sea and fountains of water. And another messenger followed, saying, Babel is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the, the wine of the wrath of her whoring. Some of this we have personally experienced in what we have learned. And a third messenger followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives the mark upon his forehead or upon his head, 
He also shall drink of the wine of the wrath of Elohim, which is poured out undiluted into the cup of his wrath, and he shall be tortured with fire and sulfur before the set-apart messengers and before the Lamb. And the smoke of their torture goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, those worshiping the beast and his image, also if anyone receives the mark of his name. Here is the endurance of the set-apart ones. Here are those guarding the commands of Elohim and the belief of Yahushua. As far as the bride goes, I hear a lot about the bride. Here's what I noticed in Revelation, Revelation 21. And I saw a renewed heaven and a renewed earth, for the former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea is no more. And I, Yohanan, saw the set-apart city, renewed Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from Elohim, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the heaven saying, See, the booth of Elohim is with men, and he shall dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and Elohim, Elo, Elohim himself shall be with them, and be their Elohim. And Elohim shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor mourning, nor crying. And there shall be no more pain, for the former matters have passed away. And he who was sitting on the throne said, See, I make all matters new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and trustworthy. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Aleph and the Ta, the beginning and the end. To the one who thirsts I shall give of the fountain of the water of life without payment. The one who overcomes shall inherit all this. And I shall be his Elohim, and he shall be my son. But as for the cowardly and tr untrustworthy, and abominable, and murderers, and those who whore, and drug sorcerers, and idolaters, and all the false. Their part is in the lake which burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And one of the seven messengers who held the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and spoke with me, saying, Come, I shall show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the set apart Yerushalayim, descending out of the heaven before, uh, uh, descending out of the heaven from Elohim, having the esteem of Elohim, and her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and having a great and high wall, having twelve gates, and at the gates twelve messengers, and names written on them, which are those of the twelve tribes of the children of Yashareel. Want to enter the new Jerusalem? There are 12 gates for the 12 tribes of Yashorel, not 40,000 gates for all 40,000 Christian denominations. If you have appreciated the message brought to you today, please send me a friend request on Facebook. If we are not already friends, Jonathan and I will help you learn the ways of Yahuwah to the extent that we are able and knowledgeable, and we will get you hooked up with others who have been walking in the name of Yahuwah and in his hooks, in his ways for a while. Please share this video with everyone you love and care about who loves the Creator, though they don't know his name. Yahuwah is fishing for his people, and this message gets out by our sharing it. Um, if you are able to make a donation to our ministry, we work at Yahuwah's ministry full-time, and we appreciate what Yahuwah would place on your heart to give as a gift offering for the furthering of his word and his covenant into the world, seeking for the lost sheep of Yashorel as Yahushua did. Please make sure you are subscribed to our channel and share this video with anyone who will hear the call of Yahuwah. Ephraim, come home. It's time to come home to our Father, and soon it will be time to go home to our land, our inheritance on this earth, as it is prophesied in his word. Codesearcher.net is Jonathan's channel, and there you see his um, link. If you're on my Facebook, you can get from it, to it from there. And my ministry is called 12 Tribes Hebrew, which means 12 Tribes Hebrew. We work together for our Most High Elohim, Yahuwah. May you fulfill the calling that Yahuwah has placed on your life. Shalom in Yahuwah.